and uh, so so the gist of uh, the gist of the discussion, and it has a bearing for for you know the second half of the talk as well, not just the portion having to do with Russia, is that the Ottomans were at that point declining, uh, and Britain and France did not want to see Russia take over the role that the Ottomans were playing in that part of the world. So this is how the alliance is going to come about, and as I mentioned to you, it would eventually lead to, so, so Britain and France supported the Ottomans, leading to the defeat of Russia, a war with very heavy casualties uh, on each side about it's estimated roughly about a quarter of a million people died, soldiers died on each side, Russia suffering a clear defeat. Um, and the Russian Black Sea uh, port, a uh, Black Sea Russian port of Sebastopol is going to be captured by the British, right? Uh, uh, the second thing I mentioned to you was that it is during the Crimean War uh, that uh, a figure emerges, and that figure is Florence Nightingale, and, and I wanted to you know, highlight not simply her as a figure, but the birth of modern nursing. Uh, but I had made a number of observations apropos of the emergence of Florence Nightingale, such as the fact that this is now a way for women to enter into the public sphere, uh, particularly to take on a profession. Uh, and as I suggested to you, if we're trying to understand the modern professions today and understand why is it that certain professions, why the professions are so gendered, uh, which they are to a substantial extent. Uh, you know, I'm sure that all of you are aware that there's been a concerted endeavor over the last couple of decades to, to increase uh, the number of women in STEM subjects, for example, just as an illustration, but, but notwithstanding all of these efforts, the professions continue to be highly gendered, and nursing, of course, is one of those professions which in many respects is highly gendered. So even though nursing, the nursing was an avenue for women to get into the public sphere, it had other implications you know, as well. And then the third thing I mentioned to you was, uh, was the position of Russia itself in the mid 19th century, uh, uh, but I'm going to elaborate upon that because basically I had started off by telling you about uh, the relative position of Russia in comparison to Britain uh, and Germany and the United States, that Russia was still, uh, was still, if I may use the word in the conventional sense, highly underdeveloped in comparison to these other three countries. If you're looking at such things as energy consumption, for example, uh, the length of railroads uh, uh, in these countries, uh, so forth and so on, right? If you use all of those kinds of conventional criteria. But let us go back very quickly to the mid 19th century because we are really here trying to understand what is happening in Russia. So Alexander II is the Tsar and he's going to eliminate uh, in the mid 19th century, and he's going to eliminate serfdom in 1861. Uh, you know, these are, it, 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 this this is, uh, incident can of course be studied purely with reference to Russian history, but of course you can also study it in an international context because remember that 1861 is also the year of the American Civil War, and then 1863 uh, you have the Emancipation Proclamation, right? And what does the Emancipation Proclamation do, at least in a formal sense? It obviously frees the slaves uh, and makes uh, American, African Americans uh, uh, capable of achieving, you know, some notion of liberty uh, and, of course, at least some form of notion of citizenship. So, 1863 in the U.S., 1861 in Russia. This is what I mean: that you can take it out of a purely Russian context and you can think about this as some kind of international campaign against unfree labor. And of course, the Indian. Rebellion with 1857-58 can be accommodated within that framework. So within a few years, you have these developments on a number of fronts. Uh, now, uh, the position of slaves post 18, uh, a position of serfs uh, post 1861 uh, was obviously going to be somewhat better than it had been before the elimination of serfdom by Alexander II. But they didn't really gain the, the serfs didn't really gain what you might call new political rights at the national level. They were still tied to their village uh, until such time as they could pay for the land that they had been given because th there, was a, there were small tracts of land that had been parceled out. So this money that they had to pay in order to be truly in possession of their land was called redemption money. Uh, and that money usually went to the aristocrats who of course were the ones who 
owned that land until such time as the serfs were able to buy it back, and the aristocrats would maintain their lifestyle with that money. There is no substantial increase in agricultural productivity. Traditional methods of farming were still being used uh, in Russia, uh, and the plots of land were still relatively small. This is going to become a big consideration for the Bolsheviks when they assume power, because one of the things they're going to do, of course, is what is called the collectivization of agriculture. Uh, and this is where I want to get into the second sidebar. The first sidebar was Florence Nightingale. The second uh, is uh, the history of the potato, the history of the potato. Uh, there's, a, there's a book uh, that I acquired in my collection about 25 years ago. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a long, dry study, but uh, I read portions of it then, and it left a deep impress on me. It's called The History and Social Influence of the Potato. Right? Remember that one of the things I mentioned to you, that one of the ways in which you can do world history is you can obviously look uh, at certain commodities. You can look at sugar, you can look at potato, you can look at corn, you can look at wheat, uh, tea, coffee, cocoa. Right? And then you can track the histories of all of these and the various networks that really develop. Uh, but the potato is, is extraordinarily interesting because, because it is the increased use of the potato uh, in uh, the West that was going to spur population growth. Uh, and not just in Russia, where it was a staple, but in other parts of Western Europe as well but particularly in Russia. On the other hand, of course, we have the history of <coughs> Ireland, where the failure of the potato crop led to this massive outward immigration. Do you remember the statistics I had shown you of immigration into the United States and what, pro what proportion of the population of Ireland uh, had actually fled the country? So the potato is, as you know, uh, a new world crop cultivated extensively in places such as Peru and Bolivia. So this is one way of now tying in the history of the new world to the old world. It's taken to the old world by the Spaniards. Um, potato production in France. So I, 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 and this is, I, I moved to France here for a second because I'm trying to suggest to you it was the population growth in Europe in the 19th century has a relationship to increased use of the potato. In France, between 1815 and 1840, uh, the production of the potato went up by six times. Six times. And one of, the, one of the social theorists of that time was, of course, Malthus. I don't know how many of you recognize the name as well, but you know, Malthus has this you know, uh, prophecy of gloom and doom, that namely that what is, what is a prophecy, basically, or the theory, namely that namely that population will always outstrip the food supply, right? But this is, of course, uh, the, the, the massive uh, increase in production of the potato was one way of defeating this Malthusian prophecy, right? So the potato uh, uh, had been known in Russia now for a couple of decades, since around 1800. You have famines in 1838, 39. Uh, and uh, many people start growing potatoes uh, in their in their backyard. <coughs> potatoes are relatively bulky, as you know. They're nutritious um, and they're cheap. Per acre, the potato delivers two to four times as many calories as wheat. Okay, per acre. So there are all these, you know, considerations. The advantages of the potato over we can keep on waxing lyrical about the potato if we want, and we don't have to get in French fries. Uh, to do that either. Uh, there are all these interesting ramifications uh, which I'm simply trying to point your attention to. Uh, in Ireland, by 1845, it occupied one third of all arable land. So one third of all the land given over to farming in, in Ireland was given over to the potato. And in some respects, you can say that it helped fuel the Industrial Revolution in Europe in the 19th century, right? That's that's what I'm really, really talking about. And so just just as a bit of an aside, but you can see there are all these complicated social and political histories that we can weave into uh, the history of the potato. All right. Now going back to Russia, uh, late 19th century. So I've been talking about to you about the mid 19th century, and one of the things that's happening there, of course, is that. Uh, Russia is now going to start to interact with China as well. So if you look at this slide over here, you have the Trans-Siberian Railway. 
uh, you can see from the key over there, so you know, a, a, a long line from St. Petersburg, uh, also known as Petrograd. Uh, this, this is a, a place that has changed names many times because that's what happens when, when you have revolutions, uh, uh, the names of places change, so that's, and here you have Manchuria over here, Korea, uh, and, and this over here is the Great Wall of China over here, but you can see the Chinese Eastern Railway, South Manchurian Railway, so a number of railway networks are really developing here. There's basically going to be competition for, for resources, right? That's, that's the larger picnic, uh, uh, picture sorry, uh, that, you, that you want to uh, keep in mind. Uh, the Trans-Siberian Railroad was completed towards the end of the 1880s, and what it did then effectively, in a sentence, is it connects Europe and Russia with the Pacific, right? This is going to lead to a boom in Russia's coal and iron sectors. Export of grain to the West is going to be stimulated, and it's going to earn Russia foreign currency. Um, and it's through this foreign currency that advanced machinery is going to be purchased, right? So Russia's Asian role is going to be enhanced. Uh, railroad mileage had quadrupled in Russia by 1880. Uh, nevertheless, it was still substantially less, not even half the railroad mileage in the United States. You know, one, of the, one of the stories, of course, to be told about the United mm. States uh, is uh, the fact that this country, which at one point had perhaps circa, let's say, 1900, barring Britain, which is very small. So, I'm, so if, you, if you look at countries of, of the, you know, which are much larger than Britain, in Britain, it had probably the best railway network in the world. And today, as I'm sure all of you know, that among industrialized countries, the United States has by far the worst railroad network in the world. And of course, what, what, what contributed to that was the automobile industry, the automobile industry, right? And, and the way in which it was able to railroad the railroad out of existence, essentially. Right? Uh, but uh, one of the, uh, just as a little aside, I want to recommend a book to all of you, which uh, I suspect no one here has heard of. Uh, the, by far the most interesting book ever written in Los Angeles, and since you're staying in Los Angeles, you might want to take a look at it at some point. It's called Los Angeles, The Four Ecologies. The Four Ecologies, because the author of that, a British architect, the book was written in the 1950s, uh, Maynard Renham, he basically argued that Los Angeles was the only place in the world where four ecological systems met. And those four ecological systems are the desert, the mountain, the ocean, and what's the fourth? The free base. The free base, right? And so what he does is he gives you this extraordinary insight into how Los Angeles developed, and of course it had to do with the automobile industry. But the automobile industry came at the price of the railroads. Right? That got basically decimated um, in the United States for the most part. So notwithstanding all these advancements in Russia, I'm saying that, 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 that Russia was still, in the late 1800s, still lagging behind considerably in steel production, fourth in the world in steel <coughs> production at this point. Um, uh, although it has substantially caught up in petroleum production and refining behind the United States, you know, behind the United States at this point uh, in the late 1800s. Now, um, in order to understand what I'm calling the road to the Russian Revolution, all right, uh, we have to think about what's called the double crisis. The double crisis is the social crisis and then the political crisis. Social crisis is that from the and the period I'm looking at here is, you know, from the late 1800s, 1890s, moving into, of course, the first two decades of the 20th century. Uh, you have substantial hunger on the land because, as I've already pointed out to you, uh, the, the machinery that was used on the farms uh, is still relatively backward. Agriculture production really hasn't gone up substantially. Yes, potato production has gone up, uh, but uh, if you're looking at if you're looking at agriculture production as a whole, not very substantial. Of course, population has gone up, right? Uh, so there's hunger on the land. There's substantial peasant <coughs> indebtedness because of this whole problem of redemption money, uh, and you have glaring social inequality. The nobles or the aristocratic elite constitute 3% of the population uh, and control 
50% of the land, 50% of the land. Uh, the political crisis, long and complicated history, which we're going to simplify to a few axiomatic arguments here, all right? Uh, so the, you've heard the word intelligentsia. This is a Russian word, the intellectual class. Right? So what you have in the 1880s, 1890s is you have a tension in the intelligentsia. This tension arises from the fact that there were some members of the intelligentsia who basically were uh, looking to west, that is, to Europe, to Europe. All right? And I want to add a little footnote here. A little footnote, which is the subject of a marvelous, marvelous book by Larry Wolf. Uh, on, the book is called The Invention of Eastern Europe. The Invention of Eastern Europe. You know, where, where is the line drawn? What distinguishes Eastern Europe from something called Western Europe? Right? And one of the arguments that Larry Wolf makes here is he says that, in fact, Eastern Europe was to Western Europe pretty much what Asia and Asiatic despotism were to Western Europe. So if you look at the great Enlightenment figures, Voltaire, Diderot, people like that, the way in which they talk about the Slavic population is extraordinary. Right? I mean, they basically talk about them as they talk of, as you would talk about animals. I mean, the Slavs are illiterate, they're dirty, they're filthy, they're beasts. And this is the great figures of the European Enlightenment in France. This is how they're talking about it. So, so the, 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 uh, the Larry Wolf's argument, why am I talking about this right over here? Because I'm saying that if you're looking at Russia here, you're basically now looking at the Slavic population. And you're looking at the Slavic world as a whole. Right? And so the, the argument essentially is that before Europe underdeveloped Asia and Africa, it actually developed <laughs> underdeveloped portions of itself. That is that, it, that the Slavic population was always undermined by people who were Germanic and English, right, and French. So the Gallic, the Teutonic, and the Anglos always took a very dim view of the Slavic population in Europe. And that is where essentially the line was drawn between Eastern Europe and Western Europe. Eastern Europe was Slavic, it was un unenlightened, right, it was peasant life, animal life, essentially. And, and, and Larry Wolf summons enormous amounts of evidence uh, in support of this particular argument. So in the Slavic world, there had always been, this, and particularly in Russia, there had always been an intelligentsia which had wanted to make Russia gravitate to the West. And you know that this goes back, of course, to Peter the Great. Uh, right? It goes back to Peter the Great in the late, late 17th century. Um, uh, now this tension is, is it, it, uh, coming to the fore uh, in the late 1800s. What's the tension? So on the one hand, you have these westernizing wings, as I'm calling them. On the other hand, many members of the intelligentsia were always were also in some ways uh, uh, lovers of Russian culture. They saw the West with its materialism as inherently corrupt. Right? So it, 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 to some extent, the same kind of debate that had been played out and that was being played out in Japan, in India. Right? Remember Okakura. So yeah, you know, the West is, 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 is uh, you know, something that, that provides a model for us in many ways, and yet we are highly ambivalent about it. Right? But so there's this tension, which is, begins to emerge in the 1880s, 1890s, uh, and there is also a demand for political reforms and freedoms. Uh, Russia is, of course, under under uh, under this, uh, under a, uh, a dynasty which had been around for several hundred years now, the Romanov dynasty. Uh, and in 1881, if you look over here, 1881, Alexander II is going to be assassinated. Uh, one of the persons who's going to be implicated in that assassination and is going to be executed for his part in the execution six years later is the brother of a man called Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. And of course, we're going to see very soon in a few minutes the emergence of Lenin, right? So it's Lenin's brother who is one of the people who's implicated in the assassination of the Tsar, and he's going to be executed in 
1887. This is one of the reasons, among many, why Lenin was, of course, disaffected. Uh, I mean, this is only a personal reason. There were ideological reasons why he was disaffected with uh, the Romanov dynasty and with the idea of monarchy in general. Uh, what you also see in Russia at this point in time, uh, given that reforms were very slow uh, uh, and there is enormous disaffection, what you're going to see is the rise of anarchism. The, the birth of political terrorism, as it's called today, dates back to Russia. And there's a great theorist of that, his name is Bakunin, we're not reading him over here, uh, but the use of uh, political assassinations, uh, uh, guerrilla warfare against, uh, against uh, uh, institutions of the state, sabotaging railway lines, sabotaging political institutions, all of these methods are going to be tried out in Russia by a group of people known as the anarchists. The word anarchism, by the way, has two meanings. One is this kind of this kind of defiance of central authority, right? Defiance of political authority, because most people, of course, understand the word anarchist to mean anarchism to mean a lack of law and order, right? Absence of law and order. That's not really strictly what it means. What it means is uh, a political ideology which believes in the devolution, devolution of power, in other words, the decentralization of power, right? And a critique of uh, the centralization of power in an institution called the state, right? So this is the situation now in the 1890s. What you have is fundamentally, if I may use a, uh, a, a modern phrase, you have the lack of democracy, of course. Uh, and uh, uh, under the Tsar, strikes and unions had, in fact, actually been declared illegal. Uh, so the first revolution in Russia is going to be in 1905. Uh, um, this revolution is spurred in part by Russia's defeat at the hands of Japan, something that I've spoken to you about before in the war of 1904-1905. Uh, and when, when Russia suffers this, this uh, defeat uh, in 1905, uh, it is going to spur the movement for reform, right? Uh, in other words, the military defeat of Russia is going to precipitate uh, uprisings and unrest, and, and, it, and it is at this juncture that you have what is called the first revolution, the revolution of 1905. <laughs> what does the Tsar do? The revolution does not insist on the replacement of the Tsar. It basically is agitating for quicker political reforms, for some kind of attenuated, milder work version of political democracy. So one of the things that the Tsar is going to do is he is going to uh, woo the liberals, and he's going to woo them by creating a parliament called the Duma, D-U-M-A. Uh, uh, he's going to create the Duma, which is a uh, kind of a parliament, but with, but with much lesser powers uh, than what uh, parliaments had in Western Europe in places like Britain, for example, right? Or what Congress uh, had in the United States. There are some reforms that are announced for the peasantry. For example, they could buy land uh, uh, more freely, uh, and they are given greater freedom from these redemption payments. Recall once again, these redemption payments are payments that they had to make in order to get land from the aristocratic elite. Right? So this is going to increase agriculture productivity, but only very marginally. Uh, worker strikers are going to continue, um, and eventually we're going to find moving into the second decade of the 1900s that the Duma is going to be really stripped of its power. The number of strikes is going to increase you know, dramatically. All right? uh, but, but the monarchy is still there. The Romanov dynasty is still in power. Nicholas the second, who is the czar, is still in power. They're going to pass a new constitution in 1906, but this constitution is in fact actually going to confirm uh, the authority of the czar as absolute leader with complete command of the executive foreign policy church and the armed forces, right? Uh, so there are some reforms, but these are not really sufficient. That's the picture that we are really talking about, if you had to put it in the most general terms, right? So the social crisis, the political crisis. Um, but before we move to the Russian Revolution of 1917, uh, and there are two revolutions, the Petrograd Revolution, or what is called the Bourgeois Revolution, and then, of course, the Bolshevik Revolution. Uh, let's step back for a second 
Uh, we're going to turn to World War I in my next lecture, but 1917, a war is going on. And I've already sounded a number of caveats about that, uh, you know, such as the fact, as I pointed out, that what are called European wars are not necessarily, or, I mean, what are called world wars are not necessarily world wars, the larger European wars, uh, certainly in World War I. Uh, but the gist of the matter, as far as we're concerned, is that Russia is going to have a big role to play in this war. Four million people are going to be drafted from the towns alone. Um, that's 27 to 45 percent of the labor force in the towns. There's going to be an imposition of martial law from July 1915 onwards. Wages are going to be fixed, which means that real wages come down. You know, that's what happens, right? When you fix wages over a long period of time and they say stable, that means that real wages have come down because there's been inflation. So real wages have essentially come down depending depending on which part of Russia you're talking about and which, which goods you're talking about, between 15 to 45 percent. There's already been the prohibition of strikes. Bolsheviks, what are Bolsheviks? Bolsheviks are workers' organizations, right? So when we speak about the Bolshevik Revolution, you should know what the word means. Just as the word Soviet, because there's going to be the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, right? Eventually, Soviets are basically workers' and peasants' councils. That's what they are. So Bolsheviks are going to be outlawed. There's substantial shortages of food. And what happens frequently in war is what? Russian, right? Russian. Uh, so this is going to aggravate the situation. What we're simply saying, if I may rephrase it, is that the war aggravated the social situation and social unrest considerably, because it is exacting the heavy price. And that is, by the way, true of all most wars. You know, I mean, the United States went into war. I can tell you it's not going to be the sons of the senators in the House of Congress uh, and, and uh, in Congress and the House of Repre uh, in the House of Representatives and the Senate who are going to be going to war. It's going to be the minorities, for example, to a very substantial extent, who are going to be uh, conscripted. Uh, right? That's what happens. Uh, the elites are going to always get exceptions. Um, largely true of the middle educated middle class, too. So it is exacting a very heavy toll from precisely those segments of the population, the workers and the peasants who have already been adversely affected. Right? And this is what's going to lead to what is called the bourgeois revolution of February 1917. It is the coldest winter in decades, if you read the history of Russia at that point in time. Right? So now nature has, is playing its part. Uh, you have intense feud. Uh, food and fuel shortages. Uh, I've already adverted to the strike. 670,000 strikers across Russia. The Tsar himself goes, Nicholas II goes to the war front. He's trying to set an example. He's trying to inspire uh, the soldiers there. Right? But Russian losses at the front are enormous. Uh, Russian losses at the front have always been enormous. World War II, they're going to be of a proportion that has never been seen, frankly, in history before. And what the country is now veering towards is a kind of an economic collapse. So the Tsar is going to be removed. There's going to be, uh, the, the Tsar is going to be removed in, in, in February 1917. Uh, Russia, by the way, is on, at this point on the Julian calendar. So you're going to see a date of March, but that's equivalent to February in the Gregorian calendar. They're still on the Julian calendar. Uh, and there's going to be a provisional government that's going to be installed with a man by the name of Alexander Kerensky as head of the provincial government. Uh, Kerensky, by the way, uh, lived until 1970. Um, I don't know if anyone ever did a oral history with him uh, because uh, he outlived uh, the two revolutions by more than five decades. Now, we need one major reassessment. Uh, I'm not giving you a full-fledged explanation here of the, of the bourgeois revolution. I'm giving you the, the most essential bits. Why? Because I don't think most <coughs> historians until quite recently were sensitive to the fact that the first foray into this revolution was by women. Right? Uh, so the role of women in this revolution of uh, 1917, the February revolution or the Petrograd revolution is quite important. Uh, this is a photograph uh, of uh, women uh, leading the, uh, the first major uh, movement of opposition to the Tsar's government, which would eventually lead to the fall of the Tsar and 
the installation of the provisional government. Uh, if you Google, there's an article published very recently uh, in The Guardian uh, about the Petrograd Revolution and the role of women. Uh, and this day, which is 8 March or 23rd February, uh, is the day that is now celebrated as International Women's Day, except, as I said, in the United States, because uh, this, in the socialist calendar, this is a very important uh, day. Uh, we're talking about roughly 50,000 to 80,000 women who would congregate on that particular day in 1917 on the main avenue in the center of the Russian capital, Petrograd. Uh, and, you know, slogans start to appear, such as feed the children of the defenders of the motherland. Uh, another slogan, supplement the ration of soldiers' families, defenders of freedom, and the people's peace. And by the late afternoon, a large number of workers, male workers as well, are going to join uh, this movement, and you're going to have roughly around 150,000 people by the end of the evening, all right? Uh, but uh, I also want to add, so even though this is from 1917, um, I found when I was working on this question here, this is a photograph of women marching in the 1905 revolution. So I don't think that we were sufficiently aware of the role of women in the 1905 revolution as well, uh, all right? Um, uh, and we're going to have an occasion to link up to some of these histories uh, much later in the course when we spend uh, about a lecture on looking at uh, uh, the whole quest for women's rights and the arguments surrounding feminism and so on, all right? Now, so who are the main players? Uh, the revolution, the first revolution, the bourgeois revolution is only going to last eight or nine months. Uh, who are the main players who are emerging at this point? When the Petrograd Revolution takes place, Lenin, uh, who had been in exile in Switzerland, he comes back to Russia. So he's going to read what, lead what are called the Bolsheviks or the Radical Socialists. Then you have the Petrograd Soviet, uh, that is the moderate socialist. Uh, that's why it's called the bourgeois revolution. Uh, you have soldiers, peasants and workers. You have Kerensky, uh, the head of the provisional government. Uh, you have General Kornilov, who is the commander-in-chief of the Russian army, who attempts to stage a coup representing the right wing. So he is attempting to restore the monarchy. Uh, and then you have the ideologues of the revolution, not just Lenin, of course. Lenin would be the principal one. Uh, Stalin was beginning to emerge. He's not, of course, a major figure in comparison to Lenin at this point in time, although uh, he is in the inner circle. and, and the other great major ideologue, Leon Trotsky, who writes voluminously, including an uh, extraordinary history of the Russian Revolution. Now, the, now, we have to look very briefly at the ascendancy of Lenin. So the ascendancy of Lenin is going to mark the end of the dynasty, the Romanov dynasty. Uh, Nicholas II is going to have to abdicate. Eventually, he's going to be killed. Um, and Lenin is going to actually go against a general socialist current that is represented by the moderates. So which is why he's going to force for the rejection of the provincial government. Remember the April Theses, which you have read. And the April Theses is very, very clear, right? That the, uh, and this is, this is uh, the April Theses are also known as the tasks of the proletariat in the present revolution, role of the Soviets. The Soviets are these peasant and workers councils. And what is he very clear about? He's very clear that a true revolution can only be initiated by the Soviets, right? Not by the bourgeoisie. Right? Uh, he supports the slogan, bread, peace, land. Uh, this is the basis of the social revolution. Uh, and this particular slogan is intended to, of course, invoke the support of the three major groups, the three major proletariat groups, namely the peasants, so bread, right? Uh, peace, the soldiers, that why is it that this, that a large number of people from the underclass are always being conscripted, being sent to war, fight the wars, which of course Lenin considers to be bourgeois wars. These are capitalist wars, right? Uh, and land. And, and we've looked very briefly at the whole question of land, going back to the, the freedom granted to the serfs, uh, the reduction money, and all of that. So what's going to happen? Then in October 1917, you, the Red Guards are going to seize Petrograd, uh, and they're going to take it over. Lenin is going to be installed as, as the head of the government. 
and, and they're going to actually have a constituent assembly. You remember the constituent assembly, that whenever you're going to frame a constitution, you create what is called a constituent assembly. The constituent assembly is dominated by the socialists. They constitute 87%, right? The radical socialists, so we know what kind of constitution is going to emerge. Um, and Lenin's theory is, and this is, I think, what is very distinct to Lenin. Marx never thought of this. This was not Marx's contribution. If, uh, if we had to think of, let's say, one contribution among many that Lenin makes to advancing Marx's theory about revolution, what is that particular contribution that I am interested in taking up here for the moment? He conceives of full, the need of full-time professional revolutionaries. This is going to be the vanguard. Why? Because he says that the working class, even though they may have the right aspirations and they have the legitimate grievances, they do not have the intellectual wherewithal. They do not have the intellectual apparatus and the experience for leading a revolution. You need full-time professional revolutionaries such as himself who are going to lead the working class to the establishment of a dictatorship of the proletariat, and eventually, of course, to something known as socialism or a classless society, all right? So that is what the Russian Revolution seeks to do. Now, what were the reasons for the Bolshevik triumph? Very briefly, there's a crisis that has been precipitated by the war, right? Um, the political ineffectiveness of moderates and other socialists, that these people are still are still essentially framing their arguments within a bourgeois framework. Uh, and there is going to be considerable foot dragging as a Bolshevik seen by the provisional government. That is piecemeal reform. The pop popular slogan, which I have mentioned to you, bread, land, and peace, is going to be very successful in embodying the discontent of various people. Right? And here is a small sidebar. And that sidebar is slogans. And slogans can be extraordinarily effective. Of course, they also simplify. Right? When I was thinking of the, I was thinking of the election um, conducted in the United States, the recently concluded elections. I mean, the whole chant: "Lock her up, lock her up, lock her up." Imagine how much mobilization it did. It did. It it helped to steer some people in a particular direction. So you can think about it. think of it this way. What is the role of slogans in political mobilization and in creating a discourse of a certain kind? <coughs> and the Bolsheviks are much more successful in strategizing what they hope to achieve with their revolution. Now, briefly, the Russian Revolution in history. If we to step back and we have to say, okay, we can look at the whole strand of events. We can give you a chronology. We can look at the shortages of food and fuel the disaffection and all of that, uh, but how do we really look at the implications of the Russian Revolution? How do we consider its aftermath? So in theory, what you have for the first time, and this is what is going to distinguish it, let's say, from the Haitian Revolution, right? and certainly, of course, from all the other bourgeois revolutions, needless to say, you know, uh, the American Revolution, uh, for example, uh, the English Revolution from before, what you have is in theory at least a state that is going to be controlled by workers. Um, but what's going to happen, of course, in the Soviet Union, um, and this is the subject of thousands of books and, and extraordinarily uh, detailed and bitter controversy is, is the advent of state capitalism. Because what is the difference between, a free, between, between capitalism and the Soviet system? That, right? Capitalism is basically based on a number of fundamental postulates. The first fundamental postulate is ownership of private ownership of property. Private ownership of property. And number two, of course, that you let the market right, determine things in accordance with the law of supply and demand. The market will set its own prices. That's a fundamental postulate here. Now, what you have in the Soviet system is that the state is actually going to command all the resources. And what I'm suggesting to you very briefly is that in the Soviet system, what you have was state capitalism. The state itself became capitalistic in various ways. Right? And what you have in Russia is 
long lasting experiments with abolition of private property. That happened in China too. It's happened, it happened in Cambodia uh, under Pol Pot. Uh, it happened in Vietnam. But the, the longest lasting experiments, and I would say the most calamitous ones, were the ones undertaken um, in the Soviet Union uh, in the aftermath of the revolution, particularly after the death of Lenin. Uh, when Stalin is eventually going to his own power okay, after a protracted struggle. Right? Um, and and uh, uh, I think that if we're looking at the origins of totalitarianism, we have to really go back to what happens in Russia uh, and what becomes the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Uh, because in principle, yes, the idea of a you know, this, I, this idea of the Bolshevik Revolution captured the world's imagination in various ways. But then, and we're going to turn to this later on, not in this lecture, if you look at the aftermath, if you look at the late 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, you look at the collectivization of agriculture, you look at the particular manner in which the state was deliberately inattentive to what was happening with respect to food shortages, right? Uh, and of course, the complete suppression, uh, which I think is undoubtedly the case, the complete suppression uh, of uh, various kinds of freedoms, including the freedom of speech, freedom of expression, uh, the right to your own life. I think all of this co conspired to create a system that we can legitimately call totalitarianism and which is, of course, a system that bears family resemblance with other systems of authoritarianism, including fascism, which we will turn to later on when we look at what happens in Germany. And you have the suppression of religion. I mean, I want to mention that because there was a suppression of religion uh, in the Soviet Union for a very long period of time. Uh, and I think that this is, and even if you are a non-believer, uh, this is, I think, always a fundamental problem because when you bottle it up, right, it is always going to have certain kinds of repercussions. Uh, but as I said, I think the most interesting aspect, if we're looking at the Russian Revolution in history, the most interesting aspect from our standpoint is to try to understand how the Russian Revolution, in fact, actually captured the world's imagination. And throughout the 20s to the 70s, until about the mid 80s, shortly a few years before the breakup of the Soviet Union, the fall of the Berlin Wall and all of that, Russia was still in many ways, USSR was still positioning itself as a vanguard of a revolution. So that, you know, I remember growing up in India, um, the school I went to, um, which was a very Anglo school, it was called Springdales, uh, right? I mean, can you imagine a more Anglo name, Springdales? Uh, and in this school, in the 1960s, 1970s, created, by the way, by an English woman who came to India, was fascinated by, by uh, the Indian workers, Kisan Sabha party, the peasants party, uh, joined the peasants party, married an Indian, established a school, but in this school, guess what? It was really allied to the Soviet Union. So in our, in our school assembly morning, in the, in the assemblies in the mornings, uh, very often we would have Russian diplomats, Russian writers who would come and address the school. You know, right? And this school was also, you know, we also had an Africa club and we were very active in the anti-apartheid movement, this kind of idea of a global south. So Russia was always pictured as being a country that was on the side of the global south against the United States, that capitalist hegemon, you know, right? That was the picture. Right? And this is what I mean by the Iron Curtain and Cold War here, because there was this divide, and this was, of course, one of the long-lasting consequences of the Russian Revolution. Many proxy wars were going to be fought. Uh, many wars that were fought in Africa were proxy wars that were effectively wars between the United States and the Soviet Union. Um, two countries that couldn't afford to go to war with each other for obvious reasons including the whole threat of nuclear weapons. So that's what I mean by proxy wars. They're being fought by others, but the ideological divide is there, all right? Now, and this here is the last slide which shows you what happens is you have the union 
in the aftermath of the Russian Revolution. Eventually, you're going to have the Union of uh, Soviet Socialist Republics. These were all the republics that constituted the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. All right. I have talked to you about the Ottomans. All right. If we look here at this slide over here, so I mentioned to you that the Ottomans were uh, the Ottoman Empire lasted for a very long period of time, you know, six, seven hundred years. Uh, and this slide shows you how the Ottoman Empire slowly, so this, the losses beginning in the early 1800s, uh, and you know, it, it, you can track it. This slide will be made available to you as well. Eventually, what's going to be left? This is Turkey in 1924. So we're not talking about the Ottoman Empire, we're talking about the Turkish Empire, if you can use that phrase. It's not called the Turkish Empire, of course. Ottoman Empire, uh, and, and this is what's going to be left, basically, is uh, Turkey itself, and all of these parts are going to be eventually, uh, which were under the sway of the Ottoman Empire, are slowly going to break away. Right? Um, uh, uh, what I want to do uh, here is to set up the discussion um, by first giving you a little anecdote from an extraordinary book by Mark Mazower. M-A-Z-O-W-E-R. Uh, the book is called Salonica, okay? Salonica, uh, also known as Thessaloniki, the other name by which it's known. Um, and uh, the story I want to tell you very briefly is a story that when we're looking at empires, and I mentioned this before, one empire, many nationalities. That's something you have to bear in mind. One empire, many nationalities. Now, in Mark Mazower's book on Salonika, which is today a largely Greek Orthodox city on the Aegean Sea, the, for five centuries, from 1430 to 1912, it was under Ottoman rule. It was under Ottoman rule in the 15th, late 15th century. It had a considerable influx of Jews who were fleeing persecution in Spain. And in Salonika, you found Muslims, Christians, and Jews, all of whom flourished there. So did the Turks, the Greeks, the Albanians, the Bulgarians, the Serbs, all cohabiting the same space. One empire, many nationalities. So what is the anecdote? It has many implications. When the Nazis came into Salonika. The first thing they ask the people is, where is the Jewish ghetto? And they're told, what are you talking about? And the Nazis said, but there has to be a ghetto because there's a substantial Jewish population. They said, no, no, there's no ghetto here. The Jews do not live in a ghetto here. And he has a long description of this. It's really quite remarkable. You see, Western Europe, the enlightened Western Europe, only knew one way to deal with Jews. And that was you put them in ghettos, essentially. Why, you know, anti-Semitism, we will turn to this again later on, anti-Semitism was a much greater problem, by the way, in France than it was in Germany. You know, even though the Holocaust started, as it were, of course, in Germany, Right? And the ideologues were Germans, Aryans, as they thought of themselves, pure blue-blooded Aryans. Well, France, anti-Semitism was a big problem. Now, I am not setting up a rosy picture of the Ottomans and saying that ah, you know, everything was hunky-dory, everybody was treated exactly on the same footing. But there is no question that the freedom of religion was practiced to a much greater extent under the Ottomans than it was in any place in Western Europe. You know. And see, this is what surprised the Nazi commander. And he writes back to his superior in Germany. And if you read the letter which has been translated, his disappointment is writ large. Because he says, Who, for the average Greek, there is no Jewish question. How stupid are these people? There is no Jewish question for them. They're not bothered by the Jewish question. He does not see the political danger of world Jewry. 
right? So had these people been properly civilized in this part of the world, right, like the Germans and the French, they would have known how to put the Jew in his place. That's what he's really saying. And I begin with this anecdote, not only because it tells you quite a bit about the Ottoman Empire in some respects, it also tells you something about the nature of empires and why they are able to accommodate certain kinds of dissent, why they're more ecumenical and pluralistic, but also the real significance of that parable, in a sense, is that we believe that under modernity we have been much more progressive, not necessarily. In fact, you could argue to the contrary, that in many ways we have become much more claustrophobic and insular than was the case in the pre-modern world in some respects, in some respects. I put that for your consideration because it's important to understand that we cannot write the history, world history, in this modern period, as many historians would like to, particularly from the West, as a history of incremental progress and here, yes, here is the horizon, there's the mountaintop, and we'll eventually get there. What I'm suggesting to you here is that, in fact, we're going to look at the histories of what are called multiculturalism and ecumenism in very different ways. All right, we're going to stop over here. Um, and uh, very briefly, I'm going to talk about the breakup of this Ottoman Empire.